Hello, delegates. Welcome to the plenary discussion for day three of the biggest sustainable investment conference for academics in the world. My name is Femi O.K. It is my pleasure to be your moderator. What we'll be doing in the next hour, we will be discussing revisiting the role of responsible investment. I know you have ideas about this. You may already be, be doing the best practices. You may have revisited this role many times before. But what we are doing differently is with our plenary speakers, we have asked them to be provocative. We have asked them to leave their talking points at home, even though they may <laughs> be coming to us from their home and really bring some fresh thought and passion to this discussion. I know you won't be disappointed. We have the general chat for our delegates all over the world. I know you've already been using that. And then specifically, so that you're in this conversation as well, we have the Q&A box. Put your questions in the Q&A box. Put your comments in the Q&A box that you would like me to share with our plenary speakers. Plenary speakers, please unmute yourself. Please turn your camera on so that I can introduce you to our delegates. And they come on to stage one by one. We have Hero and Anne. Jane is standing by. Jane, click on your video, click on your microphone, and you will be on the stage. The stage is obviously a very long way away from where Jane is, so she will be with us in a moment. We have Mervyn too. I am going to say hello to our plenary speakers. The plenary speakers will introduce themselves. Anne, it's good to see you. Tell us <laughs> who you are why you're important in our conversation today. Uh, who am I? Uh, I'm a rather bleary-eyed British mother of three working for a very large US pension fund, otherwise known as CalPERS. And uh, we're here in the midst of wildfires, smoke, a pandemic, um, big worries about the future of employment, the economy, social cohesion, racial justice. So where do we begin? If we think about being a responsible investor, mm -hmm. then the point is we can't step aside. We can't wash our hands of all of this. Um, I don't think it's, I think it's rather immodest to be saying, why am I important? It's not about me. What's important is that um, the financial system belongs to everyone. All the money swilling around on Wall Street or through the city of London or Tokyo uh, or Shanghai or anywhere else, that money is drawn uh -huh. from ordinary working people's savings, ah. what we would say the Commonwealth. Yeah. And our job as responsible investors is to take other people's money and make sure that through the investment process, we're not only meeting their needs for pensions, for health, for insurance and so forth, but along the way, we're ensuring that we have value creation and risk management, and it's all aligned with society. And so this is that's fantastic. That's a great introduction. I love it. I don't want to interrupt it, but I have to sort of bring in a hero. Hero, hello. Tell everybody who you are, hero. Yeah, thanks, Femi. Uh, my name is Hiro Mizuno. Uh, I was uh, chief officer of the uh, Japanese government pension investment fund, as known as the GPIF, the world's largest public pension fund, uh, until last March. And then uh, I did that role uh, for five years. And uh, during my, you know, term uh, at the GPIF, I, you know, trying to find out the way to really uh maximize maximize long-term sustainable uh portfolio performance of 1.6 trillion dollars and then i concluded you know the uh, the conventional wisdom of a uh, finance uh you know the um uh theory or like a financial like education didn't help me as much as i had expected because at the end of the day that kind of big portfolios their long-term performance is you know, more subject to what happened to the global capital market, meaning what happened to the global economy. And uh, I concluded to make the global economy continue to have a sustainable growth, we need to make sure society, their business is operating, has to be, uh, to be sustainable. And also the, uh, the environment society is residing in 
must be sustainable too. So uh, I actually concluded at the very outset of my my uh, tenure at the, you know to best way to manage the uh, the 1.6 trillion dollar global portfolio. We just have to pay more attention to how to make the system sustainable. Right. So uh, that's why how I came up with this the uh, sort of my personal mission. So after I stepping down from the GPF CIO role, uh, I took up the several uh, position uh, in addition to uh, the PRI Principal Responsible Investment Board member. Uh, I served as a, you know the uh, the board member for the last like of three years, and then um, I joined the uh, the several major business school, uh, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge. Uh, on the agree on, on on the agreement that we will integrate the sustainability and ESG into the MBA curriculum, and uh, also I work with the uh, CFA Institute uh, to integrate again the sustainability into the uh, the qualification exam or qualification curriculum for the uh, the financial analyst uh, certification. So uh, I'm working on those, and then you know the, some people know me now as uh, the board member of Tesla. Inc. And I also serve on the mission committee of the French Kudo conglomerate Danone, which, you know, the other uh, trying to um, the ESG or sustainability at their top agenda. So uh, mm -hmm. that's, I think, why I'm here. And uh, I'm actually, you know, think this uh, the sustainability uh, agenda is my personal mission. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, hopefully, mission accomplished by the end of this discussion. Uh, Kiro <laughs> and, and Anne, I, I, Anne, I love laughter, but I'm going to ask you to mute yourself just oh. so that we have great audio all the way through. And uh, Jane, great to see you. Tell everybody who you are. Do your own introduction. Unmute yourself, Jane. Hi there, Jane. Just click on the unmute and then we'll be able to hear you. Yep, go ahead. Click on unmute yourself. Hi there, Jane. All right. This is going very well this morning. Jane, tell everybody who you are. Ah, now I don't hear Jane, so we have a slight audio problem. Let me just check. Mervyn, are you on the stage? Mervyn, unmute yourself and speak to us. If I don't hear, then this is going to be a very short discussion. Hmm. All right, so we seem to have an audio problem. We have a wonderful host in this conversation. Uh, uh, let me just check. And do you hear me? You hear me. Hero, do you hear me? You do. Uh, Hero, can you unmute yourself and speak? This is, this is me. Welcome, delegates. This is me doing a live audio test <laughs> during your plenary. Apologies about that. Hi, uh, hello there. All right, so we hear Hero. And unmute yourself and speak to us. Let's see if we hear you. Okay. Go yeah, ahead. maybe maybe I should sing, right? We can right. mix so it up a little Anne. bit. Jane, go ahead and speak. All right. James, say say hello. Introduce yourself. All right. So Jane's audio doesn't appear to be working. All right. Let's go to Mervin next. Hi there, Mervin. Nice to see you. Introduce yourself, Mervin. Hi, Mervyn. There's a little bit of video and you see that little video icon, you click on that. And then there's a, a microphone, you click on that. I, I, I know Mervyn is totally across this. All right, so this is what we will do. I will continue the conversation. It's gonna be a fireside chat, it seems, <laughs> with Anne and Hero. And then I will get Jane as soon. Jane, keep talking and keep jumping in. So I know if you are there, I see you, but I do not hear you. And um, Mervyn, do you want to try one more time just to speak to us? All right. Okay. Delegates, I thank you for your patience. Let me just remind you what the discussion is about. It's about technical difficulties right now, but the plan was to have a conversation about the revisiting the role and responsibilities of investors. Anne and Hero, we're going to do a fireside chat for now. We will change things up as we get the rest of our panelists back and we check out their tech. So, uh, Hero, you said, unmute yourself, you said that responsible investment was your passion. So when we're talking about sustainable investment, everybody has a different idea about what that is. For you, what is it? Where do we start? Well, I think the, the sustainable investment 
and uh, responsible investment is kind of like uh, I change it interchangeably uh, because some people, uh, you know, the uh, think like a sustainability is everything and like inclusion with other uh, relevant theme should be addressed in, in, in the vocabulary. So uh, when I say sustainable investment, uh, I usually mean uh, like responsible investment, uh, meaning we just need to make sure our investment activity will contribute to make the other uh, society and the environment and um, more sustainable. And uh, you know, the, we own a huge portfolio across the global capital market. So the, uh, in other words, what I'm trying to do is that I basically trying to make the global capital market more sustainable. So uh, to do that, every portfolio company have to you know transform their business into a sustainable, a sustainable business. And uh, also the uh, the government we invest in, invest in through their treasury have to come up with a sustainability uh, you know policy. So uh, sustainability should be in, you know the incorporated in every aspect of the investment activity and business activity and also shopping activity. So uh, mm -hmm. I use the uh, sustainable investment to describe that the whole that kind of whole like uh, you know holistic concept. Mm -hmm. Today we are testing if my patients and your patients delegates is sustainable, I hope so, because on stage we have Mervyn, who has been much talked about, but hasn't been seen or heard. Mervyn, hello, can you introduce yourself to our audience? Go ahead. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Mervyn Tang. I'm based in Hong Kong and I head ESG research at Fitch. And so what I'm here today, I think, is to offer a one-step remove view, because when we do thematic research here, one of the main things we're observing is how the behavior of uh, investment firms and financial institutions is changing the way capital is flowing, the way that business uh, are operating, uh, and really just the economy and financial system is functioning. And so I want to give a view when they're kind of looking at this at the systemic level, how to uh, the, how the changing roles and responsibilities of investors is leading to real life consequences. So that's why I'm here, even though I was a few minutes late. All right. Good to see you. Good to hear you. Really? All right, Jane, I'm scared to do this, but I see you. But can we hear you? Tell everybody who you are. I think again. it's working now. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. <laughs> Hi, Jane. Thank you for your patience. Go ahead and introduce yourself to our delegates. Great. Well, uh, I think maybe the dark forces in finance were trying to prevent us from having this conversation, which you know, as you say, is about how do we how do we evolve finance to be a force for good around achieving a more sustainable future? And that's really been uh, my focus through my whole career. Um, you know, I had such a great opportunity to to start the responsible investment business at Mercer uh, and and work with a lot of great uh, clients, pension funds, including Anne and, and many others around the world. Uh, and to work also with the UN actually in setting up the principles for responsible investment a long time ago. Uh, and two years ago, I actually decided to uh, take my next challenge at BNP Paribas Asset Management and see what it was like to really try to put a fully sustainable model into practice in a large global diversified asset management firm. Uh, so that's been, you know, really fun. Uh, I used to kind of stop with writing the strategy and kind of hand it over. And now I'm having to kind of you know, kind of iron out all the wrinkles of actually putting it into practice, mm -hmm. which has been uh, a little bit humbling. And I've also um, had the opportunity to connect uh, over different periods of my career with academia. In fact, I used to teach a, a course on uh, sustainable finance at the University of Toronto. And, you know, that started in 2006 or seven. And it was super easy to prepare for those courses because, you know, all of us that worked in the field had read everything that had been written on this topic. And of course, it's completely different now. I mean, the field has exploded and I think grass fee is a great, um, you know, a great reflection of that. And I think uh, the academic community has both a huge opportunity and an obligation, I think, to help us continue to make big progress in this field. Welcome delegates. Today we are revisiting the role and responsibilities of the investment community. Talking about sustainable investment, everybody has a slightly different description for what that actually means. Jane, what's yours? To me, it's about unlocking finance to be a force for good. And so that includes what we invest in, what we don't invest in, 
what we demand from companies through our engagement and how we use our influence with policymakers to do things like price externalities. So it's really a combination of, you know, connecting finance with, you know, our impact on the world and, and not just as a kind of um, passive observer of that, but as a really active participant with that. Mervyn, does it matter that everybody has a different definition? Does, does that matter how you describe sustainable investment? I think it uh, I think it's actually a good thing to have ideas being debated. I think as long as the ideas are presented well and the theories are presented well, that I think that's where the important dif uh, differentiation is, because I think with um, sustainable investing, I, people are talking about, ah, oh, we have to rethink capitalism. We have to change fundamentally the way the world works. And there are conversations like that, but it's not always like this because you can you can incorporate ESG and climate issues from that risk return perspective if you expect the externalities to be internalized in some way through regulations, through the behavior of companies and financial institutions. But you could also jump and start talking about, well, actually, just thinking about this alone isn't okay because you, we might have to think about growing the pie. There's systemic consequences of your investments. That means that actually you could benefit economy and society as a whole with your investment. And so you've got this spectrum of priorities in ESG. It's okay that people have different views. We just need to discuss it, I think, in an intelligent manner. Mm. Uh, so at which point I go straight to Anne. This idea of revisiting the role of responsible investment. Have you already been doing that? Is this an old conversation for you, Anne? Uh, never old, always fresh, always new. I want to answer your question about what is sustainable investment, because it's, it's actually good to be asked the absolute basics. Mm. Um, and I'm just thinking about this right now, and I would say this. This is about harnessing the common wealth for the common good. So this draws on the, our recognition that the financial system is a public good in its own right. And we need financial services to be in service to wider society and the economy. And therefore, being a sustain, to get to sustainability, I completely agree with Hero, you need to take responsibility. So what we did at CalPERS on this, and thank you, as Jane mentioned, she was at Mercer at the time and helped us get off the ground. We, uh, in 2013, CalPERS adopted a set of investment beliefs. And one of them completely changed the way we think about investment itself. We, um, we say in our investment beliefs, long-term sustainable value creation, uh, that's what investors need, if you're a pension fund like CalPERS, comes from the management of three forms of capital. Traditionally, we think of investors managing financial capital. That's the day job. That's the, as Hero said, that's what you're taught when you're doing your finance classes. You're taught about the financial capital. So what we recognized is that there's also human capital and there's natural capital. So in other words, we didn't quite get into this at Calpers thinking about ESG. That acronym has got a letter missing, which is F for finance. So if you think about this as forms of capital, which is really just old fashioned economics, Femi, then our responsibilities to manage three forms of capital lead us to thinking about stewardship, about regulation, about our accountability and the accountability right through the investment chain. So I would say step one is to have investment beliefs as an investor that set out what you're committed to, what your view of the world is. Mm -hmm. And then step two is to develop a strategy, uh, not just the airy fairy, you know, words, but mm -hmm. we developed and adopted a five year strategic plan with priorities, with KPIs, with milestones. Um, and that's very important because you have to identify what it is that only you can do as a capital provider, and then team up with others to get change. And we've got plenty of examples of how that's working on board diversity, on climate change, through things like Climate Action 100+. Uh, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Hero, because you're both important parts of that. So there's a lot of uh, collaboration and partnership that's needed in the financial sector. So, you know, and, uh, no man is an island, says John Dunn. Uh, no investor can be responsible unless teaming up with others in order to move the money. If we don't move the money, we won't get there on all these other issues. Mervyn, I see you leaning in and also nodding up a storm. Articulate the nodding, go ahead. Unmute yourself. 
click on the little microphone. There you go. My mic was off. No, no, I, I, I absolutely um, agree with Anne. And I think one of the battles for the investment community is that, uh, and actually we were talking about this in the green room earlier, you're kind of fighting a system where myopia and individualist thinking is kind of embedded into the infrastructure that we operate in, be it quarterly or like a very um, fast uh, uh, quarterly earnings reports, um, uh, quarterly demands for investment performance. Um, a, a lot of things are operating in a way where it doesn't actually facilitate that long-term value creation point of view. And so as we start talking about the steps to create um, um, a system where investors can take these views, we need to, I think, kind of rethink the infrastructure and even rethink in some cases, the modern portfolio theory and other financial theories, which also incorporate some of the short-termism. Jane, I, I know that one of the things that you do, and you're very focused on climate action, uh, how do you, work and invest so that climate change actually happens. And that gives us a real sort of world example. Can you take us through what uh, you're doing right now and the strategies you're using in order to affect uh, responsible investment? Sure, I mean, climate is a, a huge theme for us. And in fact, mm -hmm. uh, BNP Private Asset Management committed to align our portfolio with the Paris Agreement uh, when, it, when it was launched. And, you know, it's a little bit easier said than done sometimes because, you know, we all, you know, rely on high quality data and information. Um, and at the same time, you know, we rely on companies and other things we're investing in actually, you know, aligning with that pathway. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we take our role very seriously in terms of pushing for that change. So, you know, I, I would highlight a few tools that, that we have and areas we're focused on to really align with Paris. One is around investing in in good stuff in green right so we've got a lot of different investment strategies from you know an energy transition alignment fund low carbon indices green bonds sustainable infrastructure right putting capital to work in the areas where we need to see more investment another is around divestment uh, so we have a whole bunch of companies that we don't invest in um, and I, and we've actually launched a, a power generation policy around coal where we we expect uh, utilities that we invest in to have a Paris aligned um, carbon intensity pathway. So we use the International Energy Agency Sustainable Deva Development Scenario, which is broadly two degree aligned. You know, they say we need to get to 327 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour by 2025, you know, starting from this year. So we expect power generation companies to be on that pathway and it's evidence based. So we look at what what is their emission intensity and that's where we draw the line. However, there are 15 uh, companies right now that technically are on the wrong side of our threshold, but who've shown us that they have capital expenditure plans that will put them on a Paris pathway. So we make an exception for them. We say, OK, well, show us, demonstrate to us within the next two years that you're actually going to change your power generation mix and get on that right pathway. So we use the range of, you know, invest in the green, avoid the really brown, mm. and use our influence in the middle to kind of push companies to change, both through company engagement and, and public policy advocacy. So I think it's really about having that kind of well-rounded approach, and we use that on climate. But climate's not the only big issue, right? We, you know, we're, we're just kind of honing our strategy around biodiversity and environmental sustainability. And, you know, equality and inclusive growth is another, another big topic that we could spend a whole session on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Hiro, I, I, in the context of you advising the Japanese government, which you do, and we're looking at revisiting the role of responsible investment, how over the years have you seen that change? Well, I think the, uh, you know... Um, Try not to get Hiro into trouble here. Yeah, sometimes... Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear, hear, hear me? Yeah. So I think the first of all, before just uh, address, you know, uh, responding to your uh, direct question, first of all, you know, that I always try to uh, be careful not to actually be, uh, create the new sort of a new investment strategy, which is called the sustainable investment or like an impact the investment, responsible investment, because it's sometimes people think like what they are doing has no impact, has no sustainability, you know, the uh, connection or has no responsibility associated outside of the financial performance. So uh, 
I always try to say like, you know, that every single investment decision, any decision made by investors come with the consequence, which is outside of the uh, the financial uh, performance of the portfolio. So uh, it's more like the, uh, that we just, uh, I just trying to make people realize, you know, that every asset allocation decision or asset manager selection decision or, you know, the index selection decision and also the choosing a credit rating agency has an impact not only on their financial or portfolio performance, but outside of that, but the other consequence of the impact will hit your portfolio return in the long run. So uh, it's very important for the people to have like a holistic view of what's happening because unfortunately I grew up in this industry and uh, every like a finance education I received basically trying to teach me how to outperform the other people. Right. So the other here, what we are talking about is, of course, for us to be competitive in this industry, we have to beat competitors. But as an owner, we are not competing with each other and we have to more collaborate to make sure what we own will have the, you know, the sustainable value creation as the unmentioned. So uh, that's something we need. And, uh, you know, the, you asked me about the other, you know, my involvement with the other policy maker here, because I actually found that it's very important to bring the policymaker on board because I'll give you one example. Uh, when the uh, uh, UN Secretary General Guterres, uh, you know, you know, trying to put together asset owners to create the big asset owner alliance to target the, uh, the zero uh, net zero uh, by 2050, you know, the uh, the coalition called the uh, Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. I personally wanted to participate, but. At that time, Japanese government didn't make the commitment yet to achieve 20, you know, zero and uh, net zero by 2050. So I felt it as a kind of like a self-contradictory because the half of our portfolio resides in Japan, and uh, even half of that is actually we own Japanese government bond. So uh, sometimes it actually sounds a little bit, you know, the uh, uh, it's, it's, it sounds a bit silly, and some you know, it's actually self-contradictory. Uh, trying to create the other uh, big portfolio, which is not in line with the other uh, general policy guidelines. So uh, we just need to bring. I thought we need to bring this uh, the policy maker uh, on side and uh, push this agenda forward together. I decided to be more deeply involved with the Japanese government after I departed from the uh, GPIF. And you're making notes. Share your notes with us. Um, yeah, what, what was I, um, I was reminding myself that I need to follow up with Hero on several things. <laughs> um, but the big point here is um, a partnership. You know, we've, as investors, we've got our fiduciary, as, you know, Jane, Mervyn and Hero, we're all saying this, but we rely on government to set the rules of the game. Now, let's take something like um, data and corporate reporting. Imagine this. Here we are sitting in California where even in the day, it's dark because the wildfires have filled the sky with smoke. We can't breathe. We can barely see. This is horrific. And California is not the only part of the world that's being affected right now by climate change. And yet we cannot get basic information from companies which is consistent, reliable, um, has gone through the audit process, integrated into the financials. And yesterday, the, uh, you know, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, CFTC, came out with a risk report saying quite clearly, for the first time from a U.S. regulatory commission, climate change is a financial risk. So we've got that in the U.S. We've got all the good work of the TCFD, which, you know, Jane and Hero were both very involved in. Mm -hmm. So everybody is saying we need this danger is um, understood to be there, but we're not forcing, requiring, requesting the data and the uh, information that we need. Now, who sits in, uh, in, in authority over that? It's government. You know, the standard setting bodies are overseen by elected officials. Another example, carbon pricing. Um, you know, Jane's giving excellent examples in the utilities sector, but the real driver 
on utilities as a huge source of emissions, getting their emissions brought down is actually the regulatory targets. If we don't get carbon pricing in, carbon gets a free ride in finance. Worse still, there are hundreds of billions of dollars of subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. So we've got um, a lack of information. We've got incentives to keep going in the way that we're going. And in this, we've got to form some alliance between the financial sector, um, civil society, business, government, um, because it's going to take that level of partnership to get this done. So, you know, we're heading into COP uh, next year, be hosted in, you know, my home country in the UK. It's absolutely necessary that if we feel that finance can be the irresistible force, then climate change is our immovable object. Because right now we're on track to for three degrees. Like, like Jane uh, Kalpas has signed on for the net zero for our portfolio, net zero asset owner alliance by 2050. We simply can't get there unless the wider economy gets there because we're too big. You can't get $400 billion in a nice green corner of the world. We're too big. We've got nowhere to hide. Um, so this has got to be fixed. But, you know, the, the sense of urgency, I think, is lacking and also the need for coordination. You know, finance can't do it on its own. We need the rules of the game sorted out. We need business and we absolutely need civil society to hold politicians' feet to the fire. Because um, Hero's example of Japan is very good, but we could tell that story everywhere. You're looking at nationally determined contributions which do not roll up, the NDCs under the Paris Agreement do not roll up to 1.5. So we've got to get government commitments and then the private sector can deploy capital and really be a huge force to, to, to move us forwards. But without carbon pricing, without mandatory reporting, we're, it is smoke and mirrors. And I think it's going to be very hard to move the money. Thank you, Femi, for listening to that. <laughs> Thank you for making notes that I could see. <laughs> Femi, just, just going to jump in there with uh, a bit... Um, so in my role, um, I meet a lot of the ESG skeptics because we have to deal with those who are really keen on ESG as well as the ones who have qu um, uh, questions about it. And I think there's a universal view uh, to what Anne's uh, acceptance of what the view that Anne said that there is a government need to solve some of these problems. You need regulators and you need policymakers to push um, to be able to fix these global public good issues. Where I think I find a difference in views is, well, first, the uh, assessment of the political feasibility. So there's um, a, a group out there who has, ah, you know what, like, you know, we, we agree this makes sense and this is happening, but politically, is this actually going to happen and at what time frame? And I think that conversation um, is it, definitely one that needs to be had. I think we also need to think about ESG, that we are operating in a world where the geopolitical landscape is divided both within nations and across nations. So um, how do you in that world um, align um, sust a sustainability view as an investor where your potential um, stakeholders may have different views? I think with climate change, there's more consensus on that there's this problem that needs to be fixed. As you move towards certain social issues, um, I think it becomes more difficult to answer. And I think it, it is uh, something that I think it would make sense where investment frameworks and uh, investors should talk about how they tackle that issue. Uh, Mervyn, if you could fix one thing, fix means that there's obviously something wrong with it. <laughs> excuse, the, excuse the leading question, but if you could fix one thing about ESG investing, what would it be? Like, you could do that <laughs> today. What would it be? Uh, I would... <laughs> If I could fix one thing, it's yeah. for it to, well, uh, for it to become the solution of the climate issues that we're talking about. That is not an easy fix. Uh, we're innovating very quickly, right? We're developing all sorts of new tools in terms of green finance, sustainability linked instruments, and we're tackling the problem, but it's such a complex problem. It's not going to get there like mm -hmm. immediately, but we are getting that direction. But if I was going to change one thing is that we had head first towards that solution, as opposed to, I guess, um, <laughs> um, meandering around um, uh, meandering around the point. All right, so Plenary, I just want to refocus 
what we are talking about today, just so that we don't lose the point of what we're all doing here. We've written the role and responsibilities of the investment community. I have a stack of really great questions. I'm going to fire them at you. But Jane, first of all, what were you going to go? What were you going to say? I think Mervyn touched earlier on, you know, the need to to kind of evolve modern portfolio theory, right? And Hero talked a little bit about this as well. And so, to me, I think that's something that that we could we could work on and identify as a real priority because I think it ties together a lot of the threads that that we've we've had in this discussion so far. Externalities are not all properly priced, and there's too much focus on short-term results versus long-term sustainability, which we will rely on to deliver long-term results, right? That ties into what people learn in school, what you learn in your CFA, what you learn in your executive MBA, the culture of the financial industry, right? How we measure performance, how people are paid. And so I think if we could build in, um, in a structured way, more focus on externalities. I mean, if we want to frame it in that sense, which I think makes sense, because we can look at what is the appropriate price for carbon, right? I mean, and we can actually build that into our model. So I think that would allow us to um, change the conversation and lengthen the time horizon and think about you know, the impact on these real factors. So to me, I think that's really something to pursue. And I think the other key thing, if I can have two, is you know, Anne was talking about the importance for policymakers and regulation to act so that we can, we can then act accordingly. And I guess I, I, I completely agree, but I also think we don't have to wait. You know, there, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of paid corporate lobbyists who are influencing regulators and policymakers, you know, every second on so many topics. And finance with healthcare is one of the biggest, you know, um, kind of lobby lobbyists in the world from a sector perspective. But we're not lobbying on sustainability issues. We're lobbying on lots of other issues. So I think we need to carve out some of our, and CalPERS is maybe the exception there. But generally speaking, um, you know, we could do a lot more to have a climate action 20 plus where we coordinate our engagements with the G20. Thanks, Jane. I, I want to pick up on this important point you just made, which is the business community taking share owners' money and using it to lobby. Now, the problem here is the lobbying when it is in conflict with long-term sustainability. We're in deep trouble. So I just want to flag that investors in Europe and in, in the United States, where this is a serious issue, won the vote at Chevron this year to say that all political uh, expenditures need to be aligned with the Paris Agreement. Now, that Chevron is one big example, and the company fought this tooth and nail, but investors won. So investors have the ability to, this is, this is, this is our members' money. These shareholder funds belong to pension fund members. So we need to get alignment on political lobbying. That's one thing. And secondly, this question about how investors themselves become advocates for good practice is really important. So yes, you're right. CalPERS does have its own federal lobbyist, Kale Gates in Washington, uh, and keeping an eye on all of these issues. So, but you need to be, I guess, big enough to justify that kind of expense. But there is an initiative called the Investor Agenda, which brings together a whole uh, uh, array of investor networks, uh, UNPRI, UNEPFI, Ceres, uh, the European Institutional Investors Group, the Asian and more. That group is helping investors be more effective advocates. So we need to take a leaf out of the book of the Chamber of Commerce. So in mid-sentence, we lost Anne, but what Anne will be doing is she will be jumping back into the platform. There is something that I have noted for, from Mervyn. When Mervyn wants to speak, he does this. He goes a little bit further into the camera and he starts to fidget a little bit. And I know he has something on his mind. Mervyn, unmute yeah. yourself, go ahead. I was actually just um, just loving the point so much and I was just smiling as opposed to wanting to speak, but I do have mm. a point. To you are leading in. <laughs> I think we both, um, we both held uh, academic sessions uh, really talking about some of the big research issues that are um, need to be considered from a financing perspective and uh, modern portfolio theory is one of them. And I think actually with climate change, 
financial theory isn't very good at capturing just the severity of the issue at hand. And I think like if we go to the basics and go, you start off with um, uh, in modern portfolio theory, this idea of normally distributed returns already with climate change because of the way, and, and we saw this in the financial crisis with systemic risk, right? Um, you have these fat tails. When, when something goes bad, it goes really bad. And you're like the, the potential costs of those tail events are really, really high. You, modern portfolio theory also has this idea, okay, you have this risk return um, trade off, but it doesn't deal with uncertainty, which is when you don't even know what this, how to really put a probability on that risk. Mm. If you have huge amounts of uncertainty, and I think who's, uh, given that we haven't had any historical precedent of if you have multiple um, extreme weather events in a world where there's higher sea levels and higher temperature, what is that catastrophic effect potentially going to be combined with like the social and political issues when it comes to migrations, um, civil unrest, um, there, there's just a huge amount of potential shock, which is uncertain. And so I think in that context, financial theory isn't very well placed to capture these issues, which means that the financial system isn't tackling it and pricing it properly. And I think we need to do something about that. <laughs> Go ahead, Hero. I, I think the uh, the you know the Marvin made a very interesting point, uh, and uh, uh, you know I must say uh, I've been very disappointed at the uh, lack of innovation in our industry. Uh, to be honest, I mean the other uh, when I try to just discuss with the other uh, leading business schools uh, how their finance education, finance uh, you know the textbook really changed over the last thirty years since I graduated from business school. It's 99%. They are teaching exactly the same thing, and uh, you know, during that time, I mean, the, uh, the all the other industry we invest in uh, and the made money really had to go through the a lot of innovations. So, uh, you know, all these kind of things where we stuck. Hira, the, Hira, Hira, is, yeah, here, here, here. I here. The the only reason I, I am butting into this is because we have a delicate delegate. Satyajit Bose says, "Hero." How do you think business schools can provide sustainable finance skills simply by adding courses to the usual curriculum? Or do we need a radical rethinking of the entire curriculum? That is what I wanted you to focus on because the question was right there. Yeah, well, I think the other, what I have been discussing with the Harvard Business School and Cambridge and Oxford are exactly, uh, you know, really spot on. I mean, the other, we are discussing what to kind of restructure full finance education or, you know, we just uh, insert the one chapter covering sustainability. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm actually, you know, the more inclined to the, uh, the try the, the, the latter first, <laughs> because the, uh, you know, finance in the faculty is the most difficult one to change, right? So uh, at least inserting the, uh, the ESG as a new chapter, and uh, it's not possible for them to deny ESG is that one of the, if not the hottest topic in our industry or in finance industry, right? So, but it doesn't appear in any chapter of the other uh, finance education, which is kind of like, I, 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 I think it's totally outrageous. So uh, I think it's, it, it should be integrated every part of the finance or investment, you know, the portfolio theory or portfolio, like, uh, you know, the uh, management, the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, study, but uh, probably we should start with inserting one chapter covering like this sustainability or ESG issue. Yeah. Jane, I, I know that you yeah. teach, you lecture sometimes as well. Are, are you moving forward with the way that you teach your students? Are you saying, well, I, I know you, the, these are part of your classes, but this is what you really need to know. If you're going to be in responsible investment, sustainable investment. Are, are you, are you flipping the script a bit? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And I see one of the questions that came in as well, which is related, you know, which is, um, what's what what makes the best sustainable finance professional? Is it someone from finance who got trained up on sustainability or vice versa? Right. And it's a great question. And so um, the class I was teaching at U of T before I moved to Paris uh, was an, was an elective. Right. So people chose to take the class. So they were people that already appreciated that sustainability was important. Right. And the conversation was and, and the feedback from a lot of them was, well, this should be mandatory because all my classmates in the other classes that aren't taking this class need to take this class because they're going to be in influential roles in five years or 10 years or whatever. And they need to know this stuff. So I think it ties in with, you know, what we've done at BNP 
is we've got uh, 25 people in our sustainability center, right, who are sustainability experts. We've got more than 400 investment staff. So we've created um, an ESG champion role. So each investment team nominates someone who's going to be the formal ESG champion in that team. So we've got 60 investment champions now, ESG champions across investments, and they have all committed to do some kind of formal certification around ESG. So there's the um, SASB has the fundamentals of account uh, accountability, sustainable accountable standards. Uh, the CFA Institute has a new uh, ESG certification, the European Society of Financial Analysts. So we're kind of cross training up the different teams to speak the same language and increase their skills and knowledge. But it would be better and more efficient if, you know, you kind of came out of your training in a sustainability school of having some, you know, some knowledge of financial theory and, and vice versa. So we're kind of making up for that. And I, Hero, I totally agree. I mean, it's been really slow. And I think that there's kind of an, some inertia. I think um, it's hard to change status quo. I know I remember having a conversation with the CFA years ago where the way that they get proposals for how to en enhance the curriculum was from CFA charter holders. Right. Who, you know, <laughs> who've already gone. So, you know, I know they're making progress on ESG, but it did seem a bit ironic. You know, how do we kind of break through that? And I think Graspy is trying to do that. But I agree. I mean, it's, you know, it's something that could go quicker. I just want to jump in on, on one thing there. I, I read this fantastic post by um, this professor, Alex Edmonds in LSE. I, I'm a big follower of his work on um, growing the pie of the economy. But one of the arguments he makes is that you actually have a lot you can learn in, uh, in terms of uh, classic financial theory in the sense that all classic financial theory is underpinned by assumptions which are then broken. And he gives the Modigani Miller theorem uh, arguing that there is no uh, capital structure doesn't have an impact on corporates until you have taxes and other issues at play. And I think that's where um, we do need a lot of, I think, where you can link that sustainability side and the finance side by going, OK, we are looking at financial theory and we're starting to understand it. And the reason why this is not capturing sustainability is because of these issues. And this is how we change it. So you can have the old textbooks, but you just need the students to go. This doesn't make sense anymore and we need to do better. Delegates, you have heard the plenary speakers talking about their ideas about the role of revisiting responsible investment and finance. And now I want to give you the final 10 minutes of this conversation because your takeaways are the reason why we're all here. All right, so plenary speakers, this is the speed round, okay? You do not have five minutes to, to ruminate on each of the questions. Instant reaction, for instance, how do you recruit staff in sustainable finance? Do you start with finance people and have them learn sustainability on the job or vice versa? What do you want people to know? Hero, you start. Yeah, well, the, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, they always, uh, you know, the, uh, try to bring in the other, uh, some non-financial professional uh, into that sustainability, like, uh, you know, the uh, uh, group. But on the other hand, those people wouldn't be integrated uh, with the other uh, investment, uh, you know, the process if they don't understand the, uh, the basics of finance or basics of the other uh, portfolio theory. So uh, I think the other, uh, if we can get the who has both sides of the experience, that would be the ideal. But the, uh, the, we, it's, I think it's really important to have at least two type of the, uh, the you know, two type of the, uh, the professionals with the you know, two backgrounds in the team. So, uh, you know, we just need the translation. So uh, when I, you know, discuss on the board of principle for responsible investment, PRI, I always try to play the role of like, uh, you know, the devil's advocate sometimes talking, you know, as if I'm just a hardcore finance professional, I don't care about climate change, right? Because they, uh, we need to persuade the hardcore financial professionals who actually are still dominant uh, you know, type of people in our industry. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's good to bring in somebody from the other side, but we need a translator. All right, remember these answers are brief answers. Hiro, could you give the name of that LSE professor again? People are making notes. The name of the LSE professor that you mentioned. 
repeated again. Our delegates are making notes. Who was the LSE professor you mentioned, Hero? It's a Marvin. I think that was me, actually. Oh, oh, right. Sorry, Edmunds. Marvin, sorry. <laughs> Alex Edmonds. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the work. Right, okay, yeah. So, sorry, Marvin, could you give the name of the LSE professor? Okay, great. Jane, this one comes directly to you. And also to Anne, if we can get Anne back, that would be wonderful. Anne will come back at one minute to the top of the hour. I know that. That's always going to happen. Murphy's Law. Except from first best carbon pricing, what role do you see for policymakers or financial market regulators to make the investment industry sustainable and Paris aligned. That is a that's a whole conversation. But briefly, Jane, do you think you can know? Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, carbon pricing, of course, is critical, uh, as is phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. I mean, another uh, key element. Um, but in addition to that, I would really push on disclosure, uh, mandatory disclosure of scope one, two, and three audited per, you know, emissions um, by companies as well as um, mandatory implementation of the TCFD also for financial institutions. And the reason with TCFD, uh, one of the reasons that we, uh, you know, we extended the application of the recommendations, not just to asset managers, but also to asset owners, which was a little technically beyond the jurisdiction, you know, you could argue of the FSB, was to enable beneficiary choice, to let everyday individuals whose money we're investing understand um, you know, how their pension fund is or isn't integrating carbon and, and climate. So I think mandatory disclosure across the investment ecosystem would help a lot. Delegate Michael Prurux. Hi, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Panelists, do you see value in voluntary guidelines and other sectorial associations or memberships and the obligations thereof as proxy for corporate engagement with sustainability themes? Mervyn. So this is not my strong area, but I do think if I kind of talk about it more broadly, um, mm -hmm. there are a lot of uh, asset managers, asset owners seemingly to try to achieve the same objectives. And so we're talking about engagement, having that collective power and having that um, a collective view, I can see being much more influential than just going it alone. Of course, you're, you're, you're also in a world where you may have different views on people, right? Just because there is this idea of going towards sustainability doesn't mean that some people might don't think, ah, nuclear is a better uh, a part of the package for um, uh, a renewable uh, transition strategy, or mm -hmm. or we think that there should be um, a slower or faster usage of um, transition uh, investment for. Um, uh, fossil fuel industries. So I think we need to have the debate there, but I think you're having these voluntary groups uh, would just ha have that conversation as well as align the engagement efforts. If I can just chip in there also, I mean, I think that they're a mix, they can be a mixed blessing, right? Because sometimes when you have an industry led standard, you get a little bit of a kind of lowest common denominator. So I think it can be often a good floor um, to bring everybody up. And often they're not necessarily articulating the, the level of aspiration that we need to see on a lot of this topic. So I think, I think, you know, they're a useful piece of the pie or the puzzle, but not the only solution, typically. This is the last one I'm, I'm going to take from the delegates. Delegates, thank you. You've thrown some excellent questions into the mix. To what extent does change require investors to face the risk of liability due to downstream impacts? Liability normally stops at the corporation. But are there signs that this is changing and is this a good thing? Who wants to handle that one? Liability at um, what the uh, as the pension fund managers or I mean, just I think the other uh, liability or potential liability associated with the climate climate change risk is going to hit everybody in, you know, the in the sort of investment chain. So the uh, asset manager will be held responsible for not you know, the alerting their clients who are asset, you know, the asset owners, including the public pension funds and the pension fund manager, which I used to be, will be liable for not protecting the, uh, the pensioners like, uh, you know, the uh, wealth, knowing these, you know, these climate changes are going to hit the portfolio. So uh, I think the, uh, that we are now getting into the situation like, you know, the, we, if, if I actually uh, the, ask the, uh, the older asset manager who used to work for me, the, uh, the, do you believe in the climate change or climate risk is real? I would think like 99% of them would say yes. And then I ask them a question, how do you hedge your portfolio against the risk? 
people come up with all the different excuses. So the knowing the risk is there, but not taking any action for that will definitely create a liability issue for the older, you know, the players in the investment chain. Mm. We're going to wrap up. Jump into, oh, sorry, go on, Jane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to say one of the papers that I actually reviewed um, that, that's being presented at this conference is the first law case against a pension fund for mismanaging climate change, which was filed by one of their beneficiaries in Australia. So it's might, something to have a look at for whoever asked that question. Uh, and I was going to say, I had um, I had one bit of a session which was talking about moral hazard and the bailouts that we've seen with the pandemic. And so I think this does push this further, right? Is there an expectations for companies and investors for the potential bailout for systemic climate risk in the future? And does that does that matter? And I think that's important because it's mm -hmm. a, how would government policy uh, react in a shock scenario? And are people blasé about it because mm -hmm. there is an expectation of some kind of government put effectively? Mm -hmm. We are wrapping up. I have a, a message from Anne Simpson who joined us earlier and she just disappeared, missed sentence, which was very dramatic. Uh, unfortunately, Anne has lost her Wi-Fi, so I'm hoping to get a little message, text message from her so she can have a final thought brought to her viewer technology that she doesn't have, but we have on the set. So we're working on that. Anne, type something into us and then I will bring it into the conversation. All right, you're, everyone's laughing. This has been a very interesting, technically challenged discussion, but I have plenty of takeaways. Your final thought, Hero, in 30 seconds would be what? What is the most important thing that you could say? You're talking about innovation, you're talking about a traditional uh, way that students are taught in the business world and it's not good enough. Be provocative. Mm -hmm. What do you want to leave us with? Well, I think the other uh, maybe the putting the Marvin in the spotlight, but the uh, the you know credit rating agency was not uh, really uh, regarded as a critical player to move the other uh, financial market into in the direction of sustainability. And when I was a GPF chief, I actually tried to change the uh, the way we manage the uh, passive managers because managing a portfolio passively doesn't necessarily mean. Have, they have to be passive owner. They can be active owner, responsible owner while managing a portfolio passively. So, so those people who are very critical and also the index providers, they actually well, paid very little attention. And that, that now it's a time for them to, to really join this movement. And I'm sure I'm very encouraged that the mommy is actually on the top of it. But the, uh, the, we need everybody in this industry to see they can do something from there where they are standing. Okay, well, I need you to say to uh, my boss that say I can hire more people, so uh, expand this effort. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Hero, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for bearing through all of our technical difficulties. You still were an excellent plenary member. I am going to ask you to shut your video off and you will be out of this conversation. Thank you very much. Please leave the stage. And uh, I, have, I have just got a message in from Anne, and Anne apologizes she has lost her wi-fi her final message is less talk more acting i think that's exactly what happened as she was in mid-sentence thank you so much and we really appreciate you jane final thought throw a grenade metaphorical grenade into this conversation what do you want people to remember from you you can hear the sirens in the background, right? Yes. This is urgent, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I would call on all the investors who are participating to really think about how you can transform your organization to be a future maker and help us to create a sustainable future, right? It's, it's a living experiment. How can we integrate it into everything that we do as an organization? That's what we're working on. It's it's challenging, but so rewarding and interesting. And academia can do a lot to really help us get there. Jane, it's been such a pleasure having you on our plenary stage. You now may, you may now leave the stage by turning off your video. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. And Hero, last man standing. Your Mervin. final thought. <laughs> Um, last, uh, last words, um, I think you need an inclusive um, climate solution, so just transition mm -hmm. to get past this political yeah. deadlock that we do have. And so as we think about a solution, there needs to be a political feasible one and socially feasible one, um, as well as just kind of uh, the, the optimal solution. So I would encourage us to think about everything and from the perspective of society, every member of society. 
Merlin Tang, thank you very much. Really appreciate you today. Uh, thank you to all of the plenary speakers for bearing with us through our technical difficulties. Mervyn, you may now shut off your video. Uh, and thank you for staying with us. I, I, I believe that what we got from this discussion was well worth some of the uh, gremlins in the works in 27 minutes time. Let me tell you where we are going with our program. There are paper presentations all through this week. And in half an hour, or just a little bit less than half an hour, you'll be able to listen in to shareholders, drivers of ESG change. That is a question mark there. And also paper presentation 5B, a financial lens into the crises of our times. Well, thank you for staying with me for this plenary discussion, revisiting the role and responsibilities of the investment community and investment communities. It's been a workout. I appreciate your time. I'm Femi OK. Have a great day. Thanks for being with us.